Amen. Thank you, Mark. The title of the message this morning is Choosing to Be in God's Will. Choosing to Be in God's Will. You're familiar with what, uh, what a, a proverb or a, 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 a saying, a wives tale. For instance, you're very familiar with this one. It says that uh, you can lead a horse to water, but... Yeah, you're familiar with those. Well, a first grade teacher in New Jersey uh, posed uh, to her first grade class some of the older sayings that you probably know, and she gave them to her first graders to finish. Uh, for instance, she said, uh, better safe than, what would you say? Sorry. To a first grader, it was better safe than punch a fifth grader. Uh, strike while the yeah, and I see that you have to be a little bit older to grab that one. No, strike while the fly is close <laughs> to a first grader. Uh, it's always darkest before. No, daylight savings time. <laughs> These are first graders now. Listen, don't bite the hand that looks dirty. <laughs> you got to think like a first grader. A miss is good as. Ah, I got you on that one. Now to a first grader, it's a miss as good as a mister. <laughs> uh, you can't teach an old dog. No, new math. First graders, and you can't do, I don't know, that new math. An idle mind is the best way to relax. Maybe my, maybe my favorite one. A penny saved is not much money. <laughs> Even a first grader knows that a penny's not much money. No. If at first you don't succeed, get new batteries. <laughs> Shows our day and age. Well, if, uh, if there was one thing that, uh, that we said to our children that I say to, to young people, that I say to to others that I say to myself uh, is I always say, make good, what would you add to that? Choices. Choices. Today, I, wanna, I want us to visit uh, and study God's Word, and I pray uh, be drawn to Him about choosing to be in His will. Not, not choosing to do His will. We can do that. We can. But I think there's a difference in doing something and being something. My challenge today is that we choose to be in God's will. Find your copy of God's Word, one that you have there. And if you, if you don't have a Bible and you need one, if you'll come see me after church, I'd love to give you one. Some people have made these available for you. John chapter 17. In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I cannot get a penny saved is not much money out of my mind. I cannot get that. John chapter 17. John 17 is, is, is special to me for many reasons. Uh, one, uh, because it is a prayer that Jesus prays for me and for you. It, it's a beautiful prayer. It's not... Uh, and, and we don't have many uh, recorded prayers of Jesus. We have Jesus praying, but we don't have many recorded prayers. This one is a recorded prayer. This is Jesus. And in the context for John 17, Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And then he prays for us. I want us to read what he says, his request for us. John 17, not another book in the world like the one you're holding. Would you stand, for, please, in honor of God's word and allow me to read uh, Five verses for us. John 17. Scroll down to your vine, verse 20. And when you get there, say, I'm there. Jesus is praying, and he says these words. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. That's the disciples that were standing around him. But for those also who believe in me through their word. That's you and me. That they... May all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, 
so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, the glory, it's just a continuation of his prayer. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that's us, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, verse 23, and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. you got to pause for a second right there and understand that Jesus is saying that he loves us, that God loves us like God loves Jesus. Oh, folks, you're loved. All right, keep reading. Verse 22, Father, I desire, verse 24, that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, what a beautiful prayer. Pray with me. Father, let us today see what Jesus prayed, uh, the, the power uh, in which he prayed it, and what it means for us today. And I pray that we will commit today to choose to be in your will. And all we do, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you and be seated. Choosing uh, to be in God's will. A prayer that I hope as, as I read it for you and as you read it on the, the screen, you, you saw Jesus, although he didn't mention you by name, he mentioned you because if you have believed on Jesus, you did it because the disciples started the chain reaction of people coming to know who Jesus was. The disciples, uh, they told others about Jesus, and, and those people told others about Jesus, and those people told others about Jesus down through the ages until someone told you about Jesus. It was such a joy this past week to hear Franklin Graham tell others about Jesus. And people have been doing that since this prayer was prayed. And you and I are the recipient of it. Let's for a moment, let's look at this prayer. And I want you to see four specific things that Jesus prayed for when it comes to you and me. Four specific things that he prayed for. Three requests in Jesus's, uh, four requests in Jesus' prayer. Look at verse 21. He says, first of all, that they may all be one. All being me and you. That we would be one. One what, you might ask. Well, Jesus is saying that. I'll try to fix that. Jesus is saying that you and I would be united in one accord. But what gathers us here this morning? It's not that this, it's not raining in here and it's raining outside. That's not what gathers us. It's not that we're going to have a meal today. That, that's not what gathers us. What gathers us this, here this morning is that we all believe in one Savior. Say his name out loud. He is our Savior. What gathers us together today is that we are in one common bond and belief that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Now, we look different than each other. We're from different places, different neighborhoods. We have been brought up differently, and our futures may look different. But what brings us together today is that we are united here because of one person, and it's Jesus Christ. When I asked Jackie a few minutes ago before she was baptized, I asked her if she had asked Jesus, the one in whom we believe, into her heart. That particular prayer is being answered before our very eyes. Because we're gathered here not to, to worship anything or anyone other than Jesus. Look at the second request that Jesus Pray. Look in verse 21 there, that they may be in us, he says. In us. Now, he, he didn't say that they be like us. He said that they be in us. It's a big difference. There's a difference in being like someone and being in with someone. To be like someone leaves a little bit of room for being unlike. 
But to be in means that you are a part of. On Wednesday mornings, I meet with a group of men, and you'd be welcome. Men, if you want to join us, hey, uh, Chick-fil-A, 630 this Wednesday morning, come. We have breakfast, we pray together, we visit, we laugh, we just enjoy life, but we, we, we bring our requests to God. Almost every Wednesday, there's two men that walk in, not with our group, that order breakfast. And they, if not identical, they have to be brothers. Because they walk in and it's almost like uh, I want a piece of double mint chewing gum because I'm seeing double. One of them walks in and the other one walks right in. There's no doubt that these two men, and men, if you've been there, you know these two men that walk in. They look identical. It is though they are from the same family. For Jesus to pray a prayer and say, Father, I pray that they be in us like you are in me and I'm in you. Is that we not just be like Jesus, but that Jesus is inside of us. And we, in return, have Jesus all around us. We are in him. Now, the Bible tells us very specifically where two or three are gathered that Jesus is here also. We are together in one accord, yes. But answer this out loud. Is God here? Is he here because he had nothing else to do? He's here because we are here. This request being unfolded right before our eyes. The third request that Jesus prays in this prayer where he's praying for you and for me and, and God's already answering these is found in verse 23. That they, be, uh, that they may be perfected in unity. My translation says it is as though God desires that we be one unified force. Congratulations to uh, many of our area bands, but particularly Pine Tree Bands, for going to competition and for getting one straight across the board. We've got several in our church that are part of that. In fact, if you're part of the Pine Tree Band, would you just stand? I know we have a couple that are here. Maybe we just, ha maybe we just have one right there. Probably the best. Amen. Uh, baritone saxophone. Am I correct? Thank you, brother. Um, I had the privilege of watching the Pine Tree Band when they were in their pre-competition. It was kind of a dry run. They kind, of, they kind of did it. And I watched them as they marched. And it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of like this. Uh, they're not all out there just doing whatever they want to do. There's not chaos. It's that they're all just moving together. And when, when it comes time for them to make a move, they do that. They make their formation. They're playing music. I can't walk and chew bubble gum. And they're playing music and keeping up with everything that they're doing. They are in perfect unity well they received perfect scores one across the board which uh, means they did have unity in that that's the prayer that Jesus prays for each of us that we together as his children together that we be perfected in unity now not that we be perfect we're not none of us are I myself uh, leader of that group we're, we're not perfect but we're all striving for one thing, and that is to be found faithful. We're striving to please God. Now, let me ask you, is that a desire in your heart? How many of you today would say, no, Donnie, I don't even want to please God. I don't want to do what God wants me to. I don't want to make God happy. In fact, Donnie, I just would rather make God mad. How many of you would say that? And that's none of us. Right, the opposite of that would be, how many of you want to please God? Raise your hand. That prayer request is being, that Jesus prayed, is being unfolded right before our eyes. That, our eyes. that is our desire. The fourth request, before we get to applying this scripture to our life, is found in verse 24. And it says that they may be where I am. Part of that, no doubt, is, is uh, in eternity. Part of that, no doubt, Jesus is saying Father, I pray that, that those that follow will believe in Jesus Christ and spend eternity with us, that they will be in heaven. Jesus in John 14 uh, gave us the most beautiful picture, I think, of heaven when he said these words, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas, I love Thomas. Thomas, the, the doubter, Donnie, the doubter. Thomas, Thomas said, Lord, how can we get there? We don't know where you're going. And then Jesus in John 14, 6 said the words that you know, you have that verse memorized. He replied with love and compassion. He said, Thomas, you do know the way, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. Part of Jesus' request that they may be where I am, I really do believe was, was speaking towards eternity. But friends, I believe strongly that part of that request was that we would be in his will the way Jesus was in his will. Because you see, you search far and wide throughout the New Testament, and you never find Jesus out of God's will. You never find Jesus away from, from pleasing God. Now, 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 Jesus was perfect in every way, never sinned, but he was tempted in every way that you and I are tempted, but yet without sin, the Bible tells us which means that Jesus was always in God's will. Friends, I believe with all of my heart that that is God's desire for us. That part of the, the, the request that he uh, asked in this beautiful passage, part of those has been answered. But this one, this one is an ongoing request that we be in God's will. Now, and it, and it is, I know, it, it's, it's difficult to, to separate that, well, Donnie, I... If I knew what God's will was, I would do it. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. That's not where God has led me. That's not what God's placed upon my heart. That's not what I believe this passage is reflecting. It is that I be in a constant state that I am in God's will. If I find my circumstances good, I'm in God's will. If I find my circumstances bad, I'm in God's will. If I find where everything fits neat and perfectly in my box, I'm in God's will. When I can't even find my box, I'm in God's will. When I can't even spell box, I'm in God's will. Friends, I believe with all my heart that choosing to be in God's will is not, well, I'm going to do this with my life or, or I've got this big decision and I want God's will there. Friends, I believe with all my heart it's a state of being. That Jesus said that we be with him. And for me, that means that as I go through my day, I have him with me and I am with him. If it's good, I'm rejoicing. If it's bad, I'm trusting. If it's confusing, I'm asking. If it's, if it's, if it's convicting, I'm repenting. If it's a blessing, I'm praising I just stay in God's will. Donnie, that's impossible. No, friends, it's not. It's not. I just have to choose to be in God's will. But Donnie, I make bad choices. I understand, and I do as well, but I follow a bad choice up with a good choice. Choosing to get back into God's will. Can I talk about choices for us? Choices. And this choice of being in God's will. Because what I'd like to do for the remainder of our time is for, for us to take the, the practical application of this. Now, this is a deep prayer. I'm not sure I understand everything that Jesus prayed when I read the entire uh, 17th chapter. But I can take the parts that I understand and I can put them into my life. So let's talk about choices. And, and let me make just three statements, really, about our choices today. And I would say this, first of all, that I have the beautiful gift of choice. I'm not a robot. I'm not a software program that was created by God that has parameters that make me do only this. But I've got the beautiful gift of being able to choose to follow God. For Jesus to pray this prayer that we be with him, means that there's a chance for me to not be with him. But I've got the beautiful gift of choosing to be there. The gift of choice has always been around. Adam and Eve, when they were created and placed into the garden, God gave them the choice. 
the choice whether to be in his will or not to be in his will. You know, we always, for me anyway, you know, I always say, you know, if, if, if all I had was just one rule to not break like Adam and Eve, you know, I mean, they were told they could eat from every tree in the garden except that one. I don't know how many trees there were in the garden, but the Garden of Eden was as close as perfection as perfection could be. So there had to be a lot of trees, and they were just given one. And I often in my mind think, you know, surely I could have just done. And then I'm reminded of the things that sometimes I do that I know I'm not supposed to do. Say things I know I'm not supposed to say. Think things. Sometimes I make choices that don't make me look like I belong in God's family. I've got the beautiful gift of choice, though. Oh, it was passed on to their children, Cain and Abel. They were given the, uh, the beautiful gift of choosing. You know as well as I, one of them chose one thing, the other one chose the other one, and then the choices multiplied, and they began to choose each differently. Choices. God didn't program us to act in a certain way. He gave us the ability to to choose that. Let me share with you something that uh, that question mark represents on the screen. That question mark, uh, it points to this statement. I have the choice to be or not to be what God created me to be. Now I turn it to each of us. I turn it to you and to me. I have the choice to be or not to be what God created me to be. I can only answer that in my life. I can't answer it in yours. So in my mind right now, I'm, I'm answering that, that statement. Do I choose to be what God created me to be? Well, what God did, what did, did God create me to be? I'm not talking about profession. I think God has called me to preach, and so I'm doing that. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about uh, anything personality-wise. I'm talking about deep down inside our hearts, am I who God created me to be in my heart, in your heart? Are you who God has created you to be? You know, uh, most football games start uh, in a similar way. One of the officials will take a coin out. And they'll hold that coin, and there'll be two captains standing there. One will be responsible for calling heads or tails. And the official will look to the visiting team and say, what do you choose? And the visiting captain will choose heads or tails, and they'll flip that coin. Once that choice is made, there's no change in it. I've never, ever seen a visiting captain go... I choose heads, and then on the way up go, I change it, I want tails, I want tails. Never seen that happen, nor have I ever seen it flipped. The officiant catches it in his hands, he turns it over like this, and as his hand's coming up, and that visiting captain sees it's not what he calls, and he said, I changed my mind. Never seen that happen. There's only two choices when it comes to flipping a coin. And friends, when it comes to me being who God created me to be there's only two choices but the blessed 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 assurance is that when I make a bad one and I choose to not be I can change I can say to God God I'm sorry I change I want to be who you created me to be I want to be that person I'm so glad that one sin does not eternally damn me to hell if I have Jesus Christ in my heart. But truth is, one sin can damn me to hell if I do not have Jesus in my heart. I don't have to commit a thousand sins to go to hell. I just have to die without having Jesus in my heart. I went to a, uh, Kim and I went to a funeral yesterday afternoon for a lady that, uh, uh, precious lady, sweet, 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 sweet lady, who had 55 blood descendants at the, the funeral. 
ch children, grandchildren, great children, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren. Fifty five, and they talked about uh, things that that represented their uh, mother, grandmother, great grandmother. Just neat, beautiful little things about things that reminded them of her and, and kind of the kind of person that she was. But do you know what the service itself focused on? Not that. The service rather focused on the fact that at some point she said, wait, I need to change. I need Jesus in my heart. I need to become a Christian. It was as though that's what gave that family comfort and peace to get through that day. Friend, do you have that? Not do you have a grandmother that trusted in the Lord. I did. I had grandmothers, both my grandmothers. Oh, my goodness. Precious, precious ladies, until the evil, wretched disease of dementia and Alzheimer's took their mind. That knew beyond all doubt. That at some time, they had said, wait, wait, I changed my mind. I want Jesus in my heart. Friend, do you have that? I have the beautiful gift of choice. And so did you. Number two, second thing that I want us to see and, and be able to apply to our life today is that in my life, I have many choices. Many choices. Not just that one. I have many. Someone once said that life is like a buffet. It is what you choose it to be. I don't know if I agree with that, but I do know that I have many choices in a day's time. Many choices that, that, that I do. And some of them are different than others. In fact, I think I, can, I think I can pile them into three categories of choices that you and I have every single day to fulfill what Jesus prayed right here, to be in his will. Some, number one, some decisions seem unimportant while others seem very important. Some seem unimportant, and some seem very important. And I agree with that. The brand of toothpaste that you use is not nearly as important as you using it. Where you eat lunch is not nearly as important as you eating lunch. Uh, will I come to church? Although that's important, it's not nearly as important as whether I have Jesus in my heart all the time. I've buried people that never missed a day at church but did not have Jesus in their heart. Some decisions seem less important than others. Some are more important than others. I think a second category of my choices would be that some decisions require immediate actions, while others, well, they take time to consider. Some require decision, right? immediate actions. Live in the moment. You have no choice. Something comes up, you've got to make a decision right there. Some decisions are like that. But now some decisions I can kind of think about and work towards. And, and, and do my research. I would say to you that salvation applies to both of those. The, the choosing to have Jesus in my heart. Because there will come a time. This morning I read the Longview News Journal as I do every single morning. And as I read it on my tablet, I go straight to the obituaries. I do that for many reasons. One, to make sure I'm not in there. Two, to make sure you're not in there. But three, to remind myself of the brevity of life. Because there was nobody in the, in the Longview News Journal obituary section this morning that thought they would be. We don't think that. We think we've got time. We do. And the truth is, we may. We may. I hope, I hope each of you have, and, and, and myself included, has much more time. Boy, I've got so much I want to do, so much I want to experience, so much, to, so much life left to live. The truth is, I don't know what tomorrow holds. Neither of us do. Some decisions 
I might can put off and think about it. Some decisions I shouldn't. And friends, here's my prayer. I, I came walking around in here this morning praying this, that if you have not chosen Jesus as your Savior, that you wouldn't leave here thinking about it. I pray that you'd leave here having made that choice immediately. Maybe that you, you, you saw Jackie get baptized and you heard her testimony and you said, you know what? That's not my testimony. I pray that you wouldn't leave here thinking about it. I pray that you'd, you'd do it right now. Joshua 24 and 15, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I think I would say that there's a third decision is that I must make the decision to be in his will every day. I make that decision. If I don't make that decision, I won't be. Being in God's will, friend, does not happen automatically. Jesus would not have prayed it that we would be in his will. He wouldn't pray that if it was automatic. He prayed it because it's not automatic. And I have to make the choice. I have to, to decide to be in God's will. I have to, to make that choice every single day. Henry Fosdick said, He who chooses the beginning of a road chooses also the place to where it leads. I've got to choose every morning to be in God's will. And then I've got to make that choice over and over and over throughout the day. Because if I just choose to do it and I say, well, that's what I'm going to do, and, and that's it, I won't. Because unless you're, unless you're totally different than me, I don't think you are. I might start out with the best of intentions, but what happens along the way? Can you relate? Is this real or is this not real? This is real, guys. There's deep down inside each of us a strong desire to be who God created us to be. But we struggle. Let me give us a third application this morning, and then I'll be done. In my life, one, in my life, I must live with all my choices. Some of those are bad, and I live with those choices. I live with the consequences. Some of those are good, and I live with the rewards. But I live with all my choices. And I know you'd say, Donnie, I know that. There's a consequence for every choice. And I believe that. And I believe there's a right choice in every situation. I don't think there's necessarily always just a right choice. I think there's sometimes even a better choice. I think there's a right, and then I think there's one that's even more right. But I've got to live with the consequences of my choices. So what are three choices that I want to live with the consequences of? Three choices that I want to make that I want these consequences. Choice number one would be this, that I must choose to look like Christ today in my life. I've got to choose to do that because I want the consequences of that. I don't want the consequences of not choosing. I want the consequences that go along with looking like Christ, because I have yet, friends, yet to ever regretted looking like Christ. But I do regret not looking like Christ. Both of them have consequences. One's good and one's not good. But I've never regretted that. And if I don't make the choice to look like him, I won't get the consequences of looking like him. I won't get the blessing. I won't get... I won't get the rewards. Well, Donna, are you saying that if I look like Christ, God's just going to throw down blessings on me? No. I'm going to say the opposite. That if you look like Christ, the devil's going to hit you even harder. Well, that doesn't sound like a reward. Oh, in my weakness, he is made strong. Oh, it's a great reward, friend. To be very honest with you, I, I, I want to be Someone that looks like Christ. And I don't have any choice. I look like my dad. I don't. He, uh, I, we were at, uh, the other night at uh, Billy Graham, my, at Franklin Graham. My dad, mom and dad were there. They came over with some friends of theirs from Tyler. And somebody came up to me and said, is that your dad? And I said, yeah. I said, I could have told you that before you told me. And I went, oh, my goodness. Uh, some things we can't help. This one we can. 
I can help whether I look like Christ. I just make the choice to be in his will. Choice number two, that I want the blessings. I want the consequences that comes with number two, being in his will. So I choose to be in his will today, every moment. If I'm by myself where I'm not in God's will, I choose to go right back to God's will. I change my mind while the coin is in the air and I'm not in God's will. I change my mind. Something hits me. I say, God, I'm sorry. I want to be in your will. I'm in his will. Something hits me. Maybe a the letter in the mail, phone call, somebody cut you off in traffic, something that, that just rocks your world, whatever it is, and you've got the choice to get out of his will. No, the coin is in the air, and I choose right then. No, I want to be back in God's will. I've got to do it every day. I've got to do it throughout the day. I've got to do it in every situation because I know what it's like to not be. Just to make sure that you're still with me. If you know what it's like to not be in God's will, raise your hand. Oh, boy, we don't even like that. If you had your choice, which would you choose? To be in God's will or not be in God's will? In. Every time. I want Jesus' prayer. I want his prayer answered in my life. Uh, three, I want the blessings of choosing to trust Christ in every situation of my life. Choosing to trust Christ. And friends, I believe that this is the most crucial point. I've worked, I've worked for, I've worked for 19 minutes to get you right here. Yeah, I do watch the clock. I worked for 19 minutes to get right here. Because I believe this is the most crucial part. Okay? Because I can be in God's will until something happens that I don't understand. And I have to choose to trust God anyway. Now I know, I know you'd say, you'd say, but not if I had more faith. You know, faith is so interesting. Faith really is. And I've even said this, you know, boy, if I had faith, if I had more faith, I could do that. If I had more faith, I could be like that. Faith, faith really is. You know, I say, if I have enough faith, I can. Or, or if I had more faith, I could trust him. What we're really saying, we're really saying if I understood it, I would trust him. But I don't understand it. What we're really saying, if I knew the details with how it's going to turn out, I would trust him. What we're really saying is, if I just knew the plan, if I knew the plan, I would trust him. We're not saying if we have more faith. We want to know the details. I want to know that it's all it's going to work out okay. I want to know, I want to know what's going to happen when that in my life is the quickest of taking me out of God's will. Not knowing the details. Faith is, man, it's not a formula. It's not a formality. Faith is, is just faith. If you can reduce it to a formula to fit in your box, it doesn't require faith. The Bible tells us in Luke 17, without faith it's impossible to please God. So I've got to have faith. The disciples in Luke 17 prayed, Lord, increase our faith. So I've got to have faith, but what we're really saying is if I just understood it, I could be in his will. Faith is so interesting. One person said that faith is a patience with mystery. Patience with mystery, not knowing. What is faith? Faith, Hebrews 11, 1. The faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. I want to do a little experiment. Would you let me? Let me out. Give me two minutes and I'm done, guys. This sermon will be 23 minutes and I'm done. Do a little experiment. What's the opposite of good? Okay, help me out. Come on. Stay with me. 90 seconds left. What's the opposite of dark? Pay attention. What's the opposite of faith? No. I heard doubt. 
No, faith is not the, the, doubt is not the opposite of faith. I heard questions. I heard somebody say that. No. I'd say to you that the opposite of faith, the opposite of faith is certainty. Now you got to listen to me. You got to stay with me. The opposite of faith, the opposite of faith is me still having questions and trusting him anyway. The opposite of faith is me not knowing the outcome, but trusting him and staying in his will. Faith does not happen when I get it all figured out. Guys, if you've got it all figured out, you don't need faith. If you've got it all figured out, you won't be in God's will. If you have doubt, that's, guys, check this out. That's real. If you've got questions, how is this going to turn out? That's real. Faith says, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I, I, I have questions about it, but I'm going to trust him anyway. So here's my challenge. Stay in God's will. But Donnie, you don't know the situation I'm in. No, but I know the God that's in there with you. Three of his requests have been answered. Three of those requests that Jesus prayed has been answered. You've got God with you. You are with God. We are unified. We all want to do the same thing. We all want to be in God's will. But Donna, you don't know how big this is. No, I don't. I just know how big God is. But Donnie, I, I've got doubt. Good. That means it doesn't fit in the box. You know who holds the box? God holds the box, friends. Choosing to be in his will means trusting him. Final question. Final. Are you trusting God with every area of your life? Bow your heads, would you? For just a moment, not long at all. Ponder that last question for me. Not are you in God's will right now. That wasn't my question. My question was very plain. Are you trusting God in every area of your life? Not are you trusting him in most. Not are you trusting him in some. Or do you trust him in every area? I say to you, friend, God is faithful in that area. I don't know what it is person beside you that knows you well may not. But God knows you inside and out. He created you. Are you trusting him in every area of your life? Father, my prayer today is that uh, we would wrestle with that. To whether or not we are trusting you. To whether or not we trust uh, your ability, your love, your perfect protection, that we trust your forgiveness, that we trust that you are holding the box or boxes, the makings of a box, our life that may be put in order or our life that may be uh, so chaotic today we don't know which way is up. Pray that we'll trust you in those areas. And I pray today for someone, maybe just one, that's here today that, that would just honestly say, I got doubts. Father, I pray that today will be a day that they begin to trust. And they'll choose to be in your will. Father, I pray for those today that have it all figured out. I pray that you'd remind us that you're the only one with it all figured out. And that we'll be in your will, choose to be. And then, Father, I pray for all of us that struggle that struggle to be in your will, I pray, that, I pray that we would stay there this week. And Father, take, uh, take our hearts and speak to them. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.